That's that. Yeah, so, so actually, the Song case was actually very close. Yeah. The Song case was actually very when close. Ten percent or whatever it was. Well, but but if, if you benchmark that voting system with the rest of the countries at the time, right? Like you can only you can only um, you can only compare a 1912 system to another 1912 system, right? So I think that for that it was it was pretty good, and then and then the same and then at the same time. Um, Yuan, with, with all of this, tried to um, consolidate power. And what's really interesting is, at the same time, that was Sun was doing exactly the same thing. He was like, okay, Tongmeng Hui or Kuomintang was too, like, I was too lenient. So everybody must swear to, 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 for like a loyalty to me. Okay, this, this, this is like Sun. And so for that, he actually offended his most important comrade, Huang Xin. And so Huang Xin left. He went to America. And so there's nobody left um, to, to be with him, apart from uh, Chiang Kai-shek. That's how Chiang Kai-shek uh, uh, became very close to Sun. It was in, the 19, in 1915, because Chen Qimei died in 1915, or 16 as well. So it was, it was Chiang Kai-shek at the time that became very close to Sun. And, but it was, it, it was it, what, what's really ironic is Sun was opposing the the absolutism of Yuan in the country by creating his own absolutist semi triad organization in Japan. It's, so it's called Zhonghua Geomingdang. So it's like the, uh, the China Revolutionary uh, Party uh, where everybody must um, swear to the loyalty of the leader. So exactly the same kind of system that a triad organization would do. And so from there, um, obviously, well, the biggest thing in mid-1914, we're in mid-1914 now, is the First World War. With the First World War, um, one of the biggest effects is, is, the biggest effects, if you look at why China stayed together, or why nobody dared to touch China, given how weak it was, was because there was someone extremely strong wanting it to be intact, and that's Britain. And so when Britain was busy with Germany, the vouchers came. Japan in early 1915, in, 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 in January 1915, gave China, Yuan Shikai, the 21 demands. 21 demands, basically, it's, it's very simple. It's uh, uh, every single, ch uh, uh, all the rights, because, because Japan was on the side of the, uh, of the allies. So, so, the, um, so, you, uh, so, so uh, Shandong, which was the influence of, in the influence of uh, Germans, uh, when Japan was fighting for the Allies, he was like, okay, I'm fighting for the Allies, so I'll invade the, the, the overseas possessions of Germany. And so they invaded Shandong. And as they invaded Shandong, they were like, you know what, China, you need our help. So your every single, from, from your police system to your military to every single department, we're gonna, uh, we demand that we put a... A, a, a Japanese consultant, okay, and which which basically makes China into a colony of of Japan, and um, we'll, we'll, our, our armies will train together. Um, I'll, um, uh, we'll, um, what else? If you ever need to give rights to any other country, you must first ask Japan first, okay. <coughs> and so, Yuan Shikai saw that. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what am I gonna do with this? And then he asked. Duan Qi Rei, who was in charge of the, uh, the, 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 the military at the time, you know, the Beiyang. I mean, China was still in, 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 like, you know, in pieces, but at least in name, it was, it was in one but by Yuan Shikai. Asked ask Duan Qi Rei, what are we going to do? At, at Duan Qi, at, asked Duan Qi Rei, um, so if, Japan, if the Japanese um, invaded, how, how long do you think we can you know, handle the Japanese? Duan was like, 48 hours. <laughs> and so, as we were, I was like, crap, what are we going to do? So, uh, the, the Yuan did the, uh, the Chinese way. They, they got the Japanese to come, renegotiate. You know, let's not do seven days a week, you know. It's kind of tiring. How about five days or four days, you know, every other day. And every single time, uh, Lu Zhongxiang was very good at tea. So they, they did the uh, tea ceremony every time. So we really make the time really long for a few months. And at the same time, the Japanese forbade China to talk to anybody about it. But uh, obviously, Yuan Shikai had really good relationship, especially with Morrison, um, a reporter from the Times. Told him about it, 
that thing then spread to America. America, obviously, for many years, up until 1949, had a very pro-China kind of uh, foreign policy and said, okay, we saw this. Even if, you, even if China signs it, America will still not recognize this. So it added a lot of pressure onto the Japanese. And so when they signed it, it's called the Min Si Tiao. So from 21 demands to 11, all the, all the worst stuff is gone. Obviously, when that came out, everybody was very mad at Yuan Shikai for, um, you know, for, for, for buying down the Japanese. But it, like, so that's why if you read, if you read um, uh, Chinese history, uh, just p especially from the uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, Chiang Kai-shek version, it's uh, Yuan Shikai stole the republic from Sun Yat-sen, and then Yuan Shikai um, killed Song Jiaren. Yuan Shikai bowed down to the Japanese so that he could do his next move, which is become an absolute ruler. But if you look at the histories in detail, you realize it's substantially more complicated because at least there is, um, there is another account and a lot of people are still debating, debating on the, uh, whether it's true or not, is did, did Sun Yat-sen uh, Yat uh, sign this Japanese-Chinese treaty? Some say they did, which basically uh, Sun was like, okay, you know what? If Yuan Shikai doesn't give you the 21 demands, I'll give it to you. If you help me to go back and fight Yuan Shikai. So, so some scholars in China believe that uh, Sun Yat-sen actually did that kind of bargain with the Japanese. And if he did, then he would be probably one of the biggest traitors in Chinese history. But obviously, this, in, this politically is not acceptable for, I think, either the mainland Chinese or the Taiwanese Chinese, right? But um, let's say he did, then the terms that he signed would be exactly the same terms that the puppet Chinese regime signed, Wang Jingwei signed in 1940, right? You've you watched uh, Last Caution, so that's the period, <laughs> right? So after signing this, Yuan Shikai was like, and this is one of the most interesting parts of history. Yuan Shikai was like, you know what? China is not better after the Republican era. There is a lot of merit for China to be an empire. There's a lot of merit for China to have an emperor. So maybe we should have one. Obviously, Yuan Shikai is like, I should be the one. So he started talking about... Um, um, he, he, he started um, sacrificing to the heavens in Tiantan. If you go to Beijing, you go to Tiantan. That's where the Chinese emperor would sacrifice. And only the em like, oh, like, who are you? Like, if I went, there was like, who the hell are you to go and, uh, to go and sacrifice to the heavens for, for China, right? So only true dragons could do so, as in, as, as in, um, as in Yuan Shikai. So Yuan, Yuan Shikai did, it, did that. So everyone was like, is he trying to, is he trying to be emperor? And then, there, and then there were a lot of people that were saying that he should be emperor. A lot of, a lot of his cronies, a guy, a guy also not coincidentally from Hunan, where Mao is from, Yangdu, 